All right, well, this is really cool. Uh, cool to talk with you, Vinny. Um, so let's just start with you know, the article you wrote on the two Bitcoins, because you have a really interesting, you know, exceptionally well-informed and impartial voice that is, that is really relevant. You know, tell, us about, tell us about the two Bitcoins. <laughs> so um, look, I, I think the reality is you have two set, two, the community has been split over the past year around what the direction is for Bitcoin. And so you had the, you know, you had the Bitcoin Cash fork because a lot of people believe that it should be um, you know, a lot cheaper to use um, and uh, it's uh, more of a transactional currency than a store of value. It's, you know, really, it's like, it's, it's, is it money or is it a store of value? And I've tried to articulate in my article, if you haven't read it, just to check it out on, on vanillingham.com, my blog. And I've given the, the, the two different strategies for what um, each community is trying to do with, with their flavor of um, the Bitcoin co code base uh, right now. And so we can dig into the details around that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, well, first of all, like, so one of the interesting things in your article uh, is I, I think the difference in values, like what people are actually trying to do uh, with these two different Bitcoins. Um, so do you want to, like, explain that? Like, what is it that, dis you know, what is it that the Bitcoin core side mm -hmm. values? And what is it the Bitcoin cash side values? Yeah, so... Again, I, I, I speak for myself and my own observations on this. I won't put my, you know, I won't say that I, I, I'm a part of the core team uh, or the Bitcoin Cash team. Um, my perception so far is that the Bitcoin core development team in the community wants this notion of, um, you know, everyone has to run a node, um, you know, it's government resistance, censorship resistance, money. Uh, and the block size needs to be limited because with a smaller block size, that means everyone can run a node. And, you know, I, I've been in Bitcoin for a long time, so, you know, since 2012, 2013, and when, you know, and I read the white paper, I don't know, dozens of times, and the, the separation of nodes in the white paper as, as uh, you know, to what it is today, where nodes back, in the white paper, no, nodes and miners were the same thing, and today they're not, they've been, they've been split out. Um, and the notion that, that the block size has to be constrained in order to give everyone the chance to run a node is, is kind of a, a deviation, I believe, in what the white paper originally said, because it, it, the whole system is about proof of work and, and largely you know, capitalism. People, miners invest money in, in um, mining equipment that secures the network. And then when you have the notion that all these nodes can do a user-activated soft fork. I mean, I used to be a big supporter of Core and, and uh, Bitcoin, uh, well, the, the Bitcoin Core, um, sort of roadmap strategy, even, even SegWit to an extent, I was like, look, it doesn't look too bad. Uh, it looks like it'll solve some of the scaling problems. But, you know, the reality is we activated SegWit using a contentious soft fork. And so if you look at what happened, how, uh, and you guys, you know, a lot of you know this already, but how we've, we've sort of transformed, well, we in Bitcoin transformed nodes from miners to sort of, um, what would you call them? Um, Non-mining nodes, uh, and how we've then taken uh, soft, you know, uh, if you look at the, the, the Bitcoin white paper, and I always go back to white paper, it's all about consensus, and consensus is always based upon hash power. And the moment you sort of separate the two, I think it, it's not looking like what it was promised to be. Yeah, yeah. So is it fair to say, so just a, a way to frame what you're saying, uh, on the Bitcoin core side, they want to keep the cost of running a node as cheap as possible, mm -hmm. and the Bitcoin cash side want to keep the cost of transactions as low as possible. Is that a fair statement? I mean, yeah. how does that sound? Yeah. Okay. And by the way, I, I've had some food poisoning, so if I'm not very coherent, I apologize. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that, that's a good that's a good. Uh, you, the, the thing is this: I, I'm a very practical guy, being an entrepreneur, having built many companies, and I really struggle with the notion that everyone in the world needs to run a node. Or you know, and and so when I'm asked, you know, a lot of the core supporters, why why you know, what, what's the what is the sufficient number of nodes in the world that the system is sufficiently decentralized? I, you cannot get an answer. I, I, you know, I said, well, is it seven billion? Is it everyone on, on the earth? No, the answer is no, 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 but everyone on earth needs to be able to run a node. It's like, it's, it's not very practical. Like, is, do we think that if 100,000 companies in the world ran a full node and the block sizes were 32 megabytes, would that be sufficiently decentralized? I kind of think yes. I think it's very difficult for governments it's, you know, to, to, to sort of attack 100,000 companies. Why do individuals need to run nodes? Um, well, so they can validate that the money's there. So, well, do you check the serial number on every single note that you get received when you go to a store and get change? No. When you go to the ATM, like, does anyone here, anyone you know, check serial numbers of notes? 
against blacklists. It's, no, it's, it's impractical. We right. just trust that the money's good. Right, right. So, so part of it is like, you know, who, who has an incentive to run a node? So, you know, merchants, for instance, and this is something we've talked about since the early days of Bitcoin, but, you know, I always thought, you know, merchants would run a node. They'd run a, a non-mining node because... Because they're processing a lot of payments, they want to be absolutely sure about all those payments. But if you're only receiving, say, $5, why would you run a node? So. Yeah. Or you use like a BitPay or a processor to do it right. for you. Right. So I, yeah, I, I think we, we, we lost a lot of like what... what and I, so for those who don't know, I ran Gift, I was a co-founder CEO of Gift before we sold to First Data. And we, we did about 100,000 Bitcoin transactions over the, when, I, when I was there. So between... 2013 to 2000, uh, we sold in 2014, so 2015 I left uh, in 2015. So in about two and a half or three years, over 100,000 transactions for Bitcoin, zero conf. And we had no problems. Uh, I think we may have had one issue uh, out of 100,000, but generally no problems until RBF came in. And RBF yeah. basically changed the entire security model of what we were doing. Yeah. And you could argue, well, you know, there was <laughs> there's ways to mitigate that. The problem is when you're dealing with consumers, consumers don't understand this stuff. So trying to explain to them that they're using a wallet that has got an RBF flag that would turn on off to get a to get an instant gift card, it doesn't work. Yeah. So that's a that brings up another sort of philosophical difference, which is it seems to me, and you tell me your point of view, but like on the core side, they want perfect security. On the cash side, we recognize, you know, it's okay actually to have a really tiny amount of insecurity if the cost of that is like, you know, lower than the yeah. gain, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. So it's the same with, with gift cards, selling for credit cards, right? So you know that uh, you may have a 1% chargeback rate and you kind of bake that into your margins. And that's why you accept credit cards. If you said, look, credit cards are risky, 1% of them are going to get charged back, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't operate. And, and that applies to any business online. If you were not willing to accept a small, num a small amount of risk for all your credit card transactions with online fraud, you, you couldn't operate. Yeah. And so it's what is, this, what is the minimal acceptable amount of risk that you can take with doing transactions? Yeah. Th there's another thing here, too. Like, you know, why, why on the Bitcoin core? So, I mean, I, like, I just gave this whole talk on achieving you know, global adoption, stuff like that. I think that's really, that, to me, that's important. That helps me. That's part of why I'm interested in this. On the core side, they really seem to value some of these things quite highly, so highly that it kind of trumps adoption. Like mm -hmm. They're less interested in people actually using it. Um, how, can, how can that be? Like, what, is, what are they thinking, and like, why, how can that be so important to them that they actually are willing to like, say, no, you can't use this? No, the, the reality is that Bitcoin is supposed to be in its current incarnation, a store of value. And I, can someone explain to me what that means? Because I don't understand what that means. It's, you know, especially when you buy the 20,000, now it's at like eight. You know, it's not, not very, doing its job very well. Like, I, I don't get the, the, and I've written tons of blog posts over the years, and, and literally the conclusions I've always, and you know, again, whether I'm right or wrong is, is up to the reader to decide, but I've always got the conclusion that Bitcoin, for Bitcoin to be valuable, it needs to be used. And people need, there needs to be industrial demand for these 21 million coins. There needs to be, you know, businesses need it or consumers need it. Back in the day, we were doing, you know, some gift card ledgers. We were trying to do stuff on colored coins. They were just experimenting, right? There's ways of using Bitcoins and create scarce, you know, the, the, the scarcity that exists within Bitcoin was meant to be used, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and the moment you take away the use case, especially limiting the block size and the number of transactions go, drops and gets lower, well, why do you buy it? Because it's going to go up. I mean, literally, the reason people buy Bitcoin today is because the price is supposed to go up. And yeah. so it, it kind of looks, you know. Uh, well, like a pyramid scheme or something, right? I mean, yeah, I wouldn't want to use those exact words, but, but <laughs> think about it. Like, most of the, like, there are more Bitcoin transactions today on exchanges than in, real, in, in the real world. Yeah. People buying and trading the Bitcoins. Like, what do you use Bitcoin for? You can say, again, store value. Well, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, I mean, let me follow up on that because uh, it's another, you know, Bitcoin Cash has a lot of the same economics as Bitcoin. I mean, there's a limited supply of Bitcoin Cash. Can't you just use Bitcoin Cash as a store of value and all of these other things? I mean, it sounds like that would be uh, apply equally as well to Bitcoin Cash plus these other use cases. Eventually. The problem we've got is, so look, if you look at guys like Roger and uh, I think myself and a whole bunch of other guys in the early days driving adoption of Bitcoin, I mean, we, we took out, my, myself and the BitPay guys, we took out, like, what is it, Super Bowl ad? It wasn't Super Bowl, it was a Rose Bowl ad or something. You know, Bit, BitPay sponsored it with Gift, and, and uh, 
you know, driving adoption was the, the key thing. Like if you look at all the if you look at all the funds that were trying to get people to invest in Bitcoin two three years ago, one of the theses for the funds were look how many transactions are happening per day on Bitcoin. Right? Transactions kept going up and higher and higher, and, then, and that was the thesis for why the Bitcoin price would rise, because people were using it. Now the transactions have tanked, and people are just like, ah, so, you know, that, that metric has gone to the window. Um, yeah. it, it doesn't, you know, for me, it, doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't quite add up. Yeah, yeah. So the transaction value is one. I mean, another thing that happened over time is, because it's literally just you know, throttled at a certain number of transactions per second, basically, We've seen a lot of transaction volume growth in Ethereum. Mm -hmm. We've also seen the market dominance of, of Bitcoin decrease. I mean, you know, it seems like you know, Bitcoin's stature is being threatened by its sort of inability to, to scale. Well, that's always been the, that's always been the, the concern. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I, I'm, not, like, I'm not a big fan of saying, well, we could scale Bitcoin on layer one forever. I mean, I, I, maybe 8 megs, 32 megs, who knows what the right number is. Um, and layer two would probably be a good idea at some point, maybe. But to throttle at one megabyte just seemed kind of yeah. silly. Yeah. So, uh, so another sort of relevant subject is uh, the brand. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, you know, when I talk with beginners, um, you know, they, they usually, like I said in my talk, you know, they'll look up Bitcoin Cash. They see a bunch of negative information about Bitcoin Cash, and that's just what they think about it. Um, you know, T tell us about the brand of Bitcoin, and what do you th what do you think about the brand? So let's be frank. Bitcoin is Bitcoin. Bitcoin Cash is Bitcoin Cash. Uh, is Bitcoin Cash allowed to use the brand Bitcoin and add the word Cash to it? Sure. Is, this is a permissionless world, right? You can do whatever you want. No one owns the brand Bitcoin. Uh, I think it's been very clear that Bitcoin Cash is not Bitcoin um, from a marketing perspective. I don't think anyone. You know, I, I, I know that there's people say that Bitcoin Cash is Bitcoin. You could argue yes, based upon what's in the white paper, right? Segwit is not, you know, it, there are a lot of things that make it different, but you, you're, you're a minority voice. So you're fighting, the, the majority of the world doesn't see Bitcoin Cash as Bitcoin, and no matter how loud you, you, know, you say it is, it, it, it's not yet. Okay, it could be. Now, what is interesting is the definition of, so if you look at what happens, uh, it, this is, a, this is an interesting, I have a couple of thoughts on this, I haven't actually formulated it, but if you look at how we, we've evolved uh, in, in, in forking, right? So the Bitcoin Cash fork was actually, had a very strong two-way replay protection, which, mean, which basically meant that the UTXO sets were separated and they could never be merged back in, right? Now, if you look at how we've avoided uh, contentious hard forks over the years uh, at Bitcoin, I, when do we get 95% of people to, to agree on anything? And yet SegWit was set at a 95% threshold, okay? Now, 51% was actually the threshold defined you know, you know, technically in the white paper. Like, you know, if 51% if, if of the hash power agreed on a certain set of rules, uh, in theory, you know, there's some outliers there, but in theory, then, you know, those become the, the it becomes the, the, the new Bitcoin. And that's what the SegWit 2x uh, group basically put together was like, look, SPV wallets would follow the, the longest proof of work chain. So by definition, by definition, Bitcoin would be the longest proof of work chain, right? Accumulated difficulty, et cetera. Um, Bitcoin Cash subsidized its breakaway from Bitcoin by having a different uh, difficulty adjustment uh, algorithm and issuing about 100,000 new Bitcoins temporarily and then so, sort of readjusted afterwards in, with the November fork. Um, but basically, it was never given a chance to compete for longest proof of work chain because it's now two separate sets of coins. If Bitcoin Cash, if the community actually got big enough and enough people around the world said, okay, this is um, more, you know, the, the price went up high enough, the, the value, the demand started growing, could we get to a point where Bitcoin Cash is considered to be Bitcoin? It's possible, but the criteria for it would be very, very difficult. Okay. Uh, under, the, under the definitions that we know. So longest proof of work chain, you know, sort of, uh, sort of tallest block height, uh, cumulative difficulty, and then you'd have to have the price. So if the price of Bitcoin Cash ever exceeded Bitcoin and there was a, a flippening and the difficulty, the, mi oh, the, the proof of work mining uh, would accumulate to the chain, you could make an argument at that point. Yeah. But it, it, it's not clear. Yeah, okay. Um, it, it does seem possible, though, just because on, you know, if Bitcoin Core is a store of value only, and as you're saying, like, what does that even mean? And Bitcoin Cash has at least as much of that, plus these other things, that just the utility of it, 
uh, that, well, gosh, if people are using it as a store of value, again, insofar as whatever that means, but plus all these other things, that would cause the price to rise, which yep. would cause miners to follow, which would eventually lead to more mining power, which then eventually would lead to the being the longest total proof of work chain. Yeah. Now, this is, I mean, this is a scenario, and I've, I've said this, that I think that is more likely than most people seem to think. Um, but it's I think it's likely. It's definitely possible. But now you're dealing with social consensus issues, right? So if Bitcoin Cash was trading at, you know, whatever, 2x Bitcoin for a long enough period of time, that would really mean that, you know, the, in terms of social consensus, the market out there is defining Bitcoin Cash as Bitcoin. And, you know, does one rebrand to the other? I don't know. We don't have rules for this. There's no, there's no rule that says Bitcoin becomes Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash becomes Bitcoin. Like, it doesn't work that way, right? So we have to be, we have to be very realistic that the world sees Bitcoin as Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash is Bitcoin Cash. Some people think, call it Bcash. Uh, I started blocking people that call it Bcash because I just think it's disrespectful. The community doesn't want to be called Bcash, and that's fine. Um, but, you know, uh, at the end of the day, what does it matter? Like, what do we care, right? Well, what's in a name? Um, for me, it's more important that uh, we, find, we, we, we look at these two as being very good experiments. Um, it's the core Bitcoin technology on both chains. Um, there wasn't a pre-mine like some of the other Bitcoin forks. Uh, and everyone who had a, you know, a Bitcoin at the point of the fork has a copy of uh, Bitcoin Cash. And let the experiment play out. So it's not going to be easy to get if you look at the transactions that go through Bitcoin today and look at Bitcoin Cash, to drive adoption, like we're literally going back in time like three or four years to get the adoption levels up. It's going to be a lot easier, obviously, with merchants like you know, the BitPay community, et cetera, uh, because the, the fees are a lot cheaper, but it only gets you so far. Uh, Opcodes being re-enabled, that's actually a big deal. That's a really big deal. Um, and so you may, you may find people get really creative with how they can use these new opcodes to do interesting things with Bitcoin Cash and... You know, it's hard to predict how this all plays out, but I'm 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 very excited about the prospects of what Bitcoin Cash can offer in terms of just more creativity yeah. versus Bitcoin's kind of constraint. So, you know, another another you know subject uh, is a lot of people are very bullish on the Lightning Network. So they think that you know we're going to you know we can we can keep the block size limited basically, and then recover all of the desirable properties. Uh, you know, with the Lightning Network. What, what, do you, what do you think about that? The jury is still out on the Lightning Network. I mean, they got DDoS two days ago. So if you're running a node, 20% of the nodes went down. Um, you know, it's, I think it's like a year and a half, maybe, from, from being really used. Yeah. So, yeah. I, mean, I, I also don't think that consumers are going to use it. I think it's really difficult for, for average people to go and use Like, Bitcoin's high enough as it is. Cryptocurrency is tough enough as it is. It, by the way, people don't realize... Everyone's into cryptocurrencies. They're not really. They're all just buying and trading them on exchanges. Like you know, my brother does it. Everyone, and he has no idea what he's doing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, um, but uh, it, it's like I, I took him to a Bitcoin conference. He's actually from South Africa, and, and uh, as well. But he lives there now. And he was in the states. He went to a Bitcoin conference, and like he was giving people advice on Bit on, on, on cryptocurrencies. And the guy, like, he's a technophobe. Not a technophobe, but he, he has no idea what he's doing. And it's just, <laughs> we nicknamed him the shitcoin oracle, because <laughs> he would just like go watch YouTube videos about what shitcoins to buy. And then like, oh, you should buy this and buy that and buy that. And, um, but majority of people out there, don't, they don't care about it. Like, are there, how many people into cryptocurrencies worldwide right now? 100 million people? How many of them actually care what these cryptocurrencies do? Like, what, five? Like, 95% of people just care about the price going up. And this is a recipe for disaster. We only have a few minutes, so maybe we can ask questions if you want to. Sure. Uh... Right. Then we begin again. Questions for our peer here. I have a runner. Do I have a, a question? I got, I, got, I got one down there. There we go, there we go, there we go. How's everybody feeling? Come on. There you go. There you go. You guys look so beautiful with your smiles. Question? Test, test. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, Rene Mangan here from Sweden. Uh, I have a question. Have you seen the adoption rate of Bitcoin Cash going up, down, sideways? Which directions? I mean, Bitcoin Cash is working off a very, very small base, very low base. It's like it's just it's very new. Think about it, Bitcoin Cash is what six months old, seven months old. It's very new. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of headroom to go, and, and I think you're already seeing. Uh, a lot of adoption. The transactions, um, it's hard to tell. 
Um, you just look at the transaction volume, how much is real use cases and real uh, utility right now. Uh, people are definitely experimenting. And because it's so cheap, obviously, put transactions through, you can manipulate that. Um, but I, my, my sense is that just looking at from a payments use case, it's going to get a lot of traction on the payment side just because of the costs. Any other questions? We have a question here. Here you go. Um, what would you like to see happen with opcodes? What would you build? Ooh, um, so smart contract functionality was something which we really would have liked to have seen in Bitcoin. I think Vitalik tried to, you know, as a former Bitcoin maximalist, I was quite disappointed. Like, I, you know, I never participated in the, in the Ethereum ICO because I was like, ah, you know. <laughs> um, but I think the, the, the smart contracting nature, the nature of smart contracts where it was supposed to, I wouldn't say it was supposed to, but it, you know, the, the, the dream was that all that could come to Bitcoin and it never did. I'd love to see that happening. I'd love to see us using Bitcoin cash for smart contracts. And, and, and that's the other thing about there's a lot of hype around smart contracts. No one's really using smart contracts. Um, maybe there's, a, there's some people trying to do it for atomic swaps, that sort of thing. Um, but, Kitties. sorry? Kitties. Kitties, yeah, there you go. Um, but I'd, I'd like to see some, some interesting use cases around smart contracts. It, it definitely is the, the, it's the, it's the low hanging fruit because there is interest in it, there's a lot of demand for it, um, from, uh, at least theoretically. Um, but you need you know, low transaction fees as well. <laughs> Any other questions? Corner there. My runner is coming. <laughs> How's it going? What's your biggest pain point uh, with uh, Bitcoin Cash at the moment? Um, look, I think, the, 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 again, there's an uphill battle for legitimacy, right, for Bitcoin Cash. Uh, I think it's, it's, people may have unrealistic expectations of how long it takes to build a network. I mean, you, you basically, to take on the Bitcoin network right now, the network effect that exists in Bitcoin, is not, it's not trivial. You know, and we, we spent years building that. There were a lot of people who spent, you know, just like five, six years of their lives building the network effect of Bitcoin, and now kind of got away from us, because now everyone's, you know, you know, Bitcoin is obviously Bitcoin. And, uh, to compete with Bitcoin, you have to build a network effect that's going to be equal to or greater than the current Bitcoin network effect, which is, is going to be very challenging. Not that it can't be done, but it's not going to take three months or six months. It's going to take years. And it's going to take, it's going to take um, you know, armies of passionate people and, who are devoted to building you know, technology and on top of Bitcoin cash. And, uh, you know, so also, like, I think chasing, you know, price chasing and all the other things, that's almost irrelevant at this point. Like, it's, it's how do you build things which can change society today and make it, and do it in a way which, look, Bitcoin has become too restrictive for this. So people have to use Ethereum and other, uh, to other platforms to try and do this. Can they use it, do it on Bitcoin Cash? Who knows? I'd like to see the core Bitcoin technology, like, it's rooted in the original white paper, which is what sold me on, on blockchain technology. It's the original blockchain um, you know, thesis. And I'd love to see that happening on Bitcoin Cash if it can't happen on Bitcoin. Hi. You, you mentioned that you were a Bitcoin maximalist. And they, Reformed. The, what's that? <laughs> Reformed. Reformed, yeah. <laughs> they used to keep saying that, oh, the smartest people, the smartest guys are uh, in the blockchain kind of community are developing for a core. So what do you say to that? Like I, the smartest I, developers are supposed to be there. but That's just a BS narrative. I mean, like... <laughs> it, so so you, can't, you can't have a situation where you have the selection bias, right? So people who disagree with, with core leave, okay? Whether it's Gavin Andreessen or Mike Hearn uh, or Jeff Garzik, like, you know, it just, so what happens is you create an echo chamber. If, if people would disagree with you on, uh, if everyone in the room disagreed with what I said and left, everyone who stayed behind would be agreeing with me. Therefore, I've created an echo chamber because there's no dissenting voices. And that's kind of what you have today. Uh, also, if you look at like diverse, uh, diversity within, within core, like how many women developers are there in core? You, you, like, anyone know? I don't know of any. 
female contributors, and some of them are anonymous, so you may not know, there may be. But like, like my, my sense is that we don't, you can't say that the best of the best are sitting inside a call. It, does, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I think I would, just a comment on that, I mean, it is true that actually some of the good core developers actually left. Yeah. And you, you might expect actually that maybe just these people that happened to be around back in 2010 basically maybe weren't necessarily the world's best at this. Sure. What, what maybe we should have seen is maybe new people coming in that actually then become the dominant sort of developers. We didn't see that. I think that's interesting. Yeah. I think it says something about the culture of Bitcoin Core that that yeah. didn't happen. Well, you, you still don't have any, I mean, I, I don't know, uh, I, I don't keep tra tabs on it too closely, but from what I know, there's not much fresh blood coming in. And I mean, I saw this one 15-year-old kid who hacked the Ledger wallet two days ago, and like I was reading, I was reading his write-up. I was super impressed. Like, wow, if these are the types of kids that are coming out today. You know, there's a there's a, a huge, uh, it's, it's usually positive for our, our industry. Um, I just, I, I don't believe you could, I don't, I don't believe you could take any distinct group of people who. That's the other thing. Like, I always, when you're running companies, you don't want a group of people, you know, 50 or even 100 people, all agree with each other. You know, like it's it's not a good thing. Echo chambers are bad, and so I, I, I see a lack of dissenting voices uh, in, in that group, and I think that's a problem. And I also don't think that you can ever take a group of you, you, so software developers, software developers, and development isn't something which is um, homogenous, right? Everyone thinks differently. Everyone has a different approach to things, and there's no way you could take three or four distinct groups of people. And say that you can you can stack rank them against each other. It doesn't it doesn't quite work that way. You can't take think about it this way. If you took if you took four teams of twenty developers and they had a and they had a uh, a healthy mix of you know really excellent to good. It's difficult to say which is the best team. It's because how the team works together, etc. Um, and so I you know I, I'm I definitely I can definitely say that I don't believe that you can say that the best are the best in that group. Because then you're saying that dissenting voices would not be the best. It's kind of a weird, you know what I'm saying? Like, in other words, if you dissent with an approach, then you can't be a good developer, which is not true. So how do we in the Bitcoin Cash community get the best people? Like, what, what can we do with all this in mind? How can we, you know, attract, you know, the best new people? Well, I think what's interesting is that you've got multiple implementations in Bitcoin Cash. You have Bitcoin, you know, good, uh, Bitcoin Cash ABC, you've got a whole bunch of, um, a couple others. I think the, the, what, what people need to have is different communities they can be part of. So if you don't like one implementation, you can go work with a different team, and you can still work on Bitcoin Cash separately. So you, that way you'd have diversity of implementation teams, and that's probably the, the way to do it. Okay. Um, you'd find a home that you'd like. Um, it's, it's kind of like, because Bitcoin is run by li literally, you've got like the Bitcoin as well, but it's literally Bitcoin Core, and, and uh, there's Bitcoin D as, as well. But like Bitcoin Core is 98%, 99% of implementations out there. It's literally, you're either part of Core or you can't contribute to Bitcoin. Yeah. There's no other implementation to work with. There's no other team to work with. Yeah. So. Do we have any more time? Are we out of time? Last one. Last one. Over here. Uh, no, no, sorry. We got to go. We're out. Okay. 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 Thanks, guys. Very, very much. Thank you.